Um, there's an interesting quote that I ran across not too long ago by a guy named Robert Cappen. And that's probably not a name that many of you are familiar with, but uh, Robert Cappen was an Episcopal priest. And he was a radical. He was a maverick in the Episcopalian uh, denomination. And he was a grace guy. He loved to talk about the grace of God, loved to talk about the freedom that we have in Christ. And here was one of the things that he wrote. He said, one of the problems with any authentic announcement of the gospel is that it introduces us to freedom. You get that? One of the problems with any authentic announcement of the gospel is that it introduces us to freedom. Real freedom. Not just the freedoms that we experience here in this world as we do in the United States of America as far as religious freedom, freedom of, of speech, freedom of press, all of those sort of things. We're talking about real freedom, spiritual freedom, the freedom to truly know God personally and intimately. That's what we're talking about. And as far as that freedom is concerned, there are some real enemies. And we have to be aware of those enemies. We have to know who those enemies are so that we can hang on and truly experience the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. I, I just finished writing a book and sent it out uh, to the publisher and was so excited to get that done, but one of the parts of it is, is freedom. And there's this scariness to freedom, isn't there? I mean, it's a scary notion to think that you can be totally free. One of the pieces of research I did for this book was uh, a study uh, on 450,000 prisoners that were released in 2005. And they followed all 450,000 of these prisoners. After three years, 68% were back in prison. After five years, 75% were back in prison. Why? Because freedom, trying to make it out there in the world, was a scary proposition. That's just the way freedom is. And we have all of these voices that are telling us, you can't handle it right? Isn't that the religious voice that speaks to us time and time and time again? You're free, but you can't really handle it. You're not mature enough. You don't have what it takes to really walk in freedom and enjoy that to its full measure. You need some rules, you need some regulations, you need some guidelines. You need some control. Isn't that the voice of religion? Isn't that a voice that we hear in our own minds sometimes? You know, I've said often that um, all of us are natural born legalists. Did you know you're a natural born legalist? When you came into this world, legalism was your DNA. And the reason it was your DNA, because there was this guy named Adam and this lady named Eve that ate of a tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. And when they did, fear entered their hearts. Total fear just gripped every aspect of who they were as people. And they pass that fear onto every single human being that has ever walked this planet. So when you came into this world, fear was your natural motivating force. It was the thing that compelled you through life. Fear. 
and primarily a fear of God and specifically a fear of His punishment. So we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We know we deserve punishment. And so we relate to God out of that fear. Right? We try to do things to please Him so that we can be in His good graces. Gina and I were watching a television program the other day, and this is my wife Gina in the green, and she's the better half, and glad she could be with us today. But we were watching this, uh, this television program, and there was a scene between a guy and a, a lady, and something had gone bad in the past for them, and he was doing something good uh, on her behalf. And she said, why are you doing this? Why, why are you doing this? And he says, I want to earn your forgiveness. What is that? That's that legalistic voice saying, we need to try to do something to earn God's favor. So we hear these voices that are opposed to us experiencing Freedom, real freedom, genuine freedom. But that's what we have in Christ, isn't it? We have been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the spirit of life in Christ. We were captives. We were slaves. We were dead spiritually. We followed the ways of this world. We lived to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's what we did. That's who we were. We were slaves. Then this great gospel message comes and hits our hearts, right? We hear about Jesus. We encounter Jesus. We hear about His death on the cross that He died for our sins. Not just some of them, but all of them. He took the punishment that we justly deserved. That's what this Jesus did. And then He was buried. And then on the third day, He was raised back to life. We get questions all the time about the grace of God. Can you out the grace of God? Is there a line that you can cross over um, where there's no return? You're just lost eternally. We get that question all the time. And you know, if there was a line that we could cross over, if there was a point where we've out the grace of God, do you know if that was a reality, a possibility, even a remote possibility, Jesus Christ would have never come out of that grave? If there was one sin that was outside the scope of the grace of God, Jesus would have never been raised back to life. The fact that He has been raised, the fact that He is alive, the fact that He is living today is proof positive that grace is bigger than any sin. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we think, you know, we get folks who call in and there was a gentleman not too long ago and he said, I, I just feel like I've crossed that line. I just feel like I've, I've sinned way too much and that God's grace can't reach me. I'm like, wait a minute. Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. He died for your sins. So He took all of your sins off of you. He put them on Himself. He redirected the wrath of God that was pointed towards you, toward Jesus. Jesus died. But he not only took your sins, he took, and this guy was from New York, he took the 20 million people's sins that live in New York, 
and did the exact same thing. And then all the people in Chicago and all the people in Los Angeles, even the folks here in Lubbock, God took all of those sins and placed them on Jesus. So think, how many sins have you committed? And some here might say a whole bunch. Too many to count. But are they more than the sins of the entire world? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And Jesus died, was buried, and He came back to life. Proof positive that grace is bigger than our sin. So we've been set free. We have freedom. We're no longer under the control of sin. We are no longer mastered by sin. The things that we do are no longer dictated by sin's decree. We're free. We're free in Christ. Scary. It's a scary place to be. And that's what I was writing about in this book is how scary freedom is. Can we handle it? What happens when we don't? What happens when freedom goes bad? And that's the topic. What happens when freedom goes bad? I was born in 1958, graduated from high school in 1976. I was a bicentennial kid as far as my high school graduation was concerned. It was the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence when our country's founding fathers, this group, this band of revolutionaries got together, they penned this document, they signed it, and they made a declaration of independence from British tyranny. Why did those folks want to be independent of England? Because they couldn't stand being under that control anymore. They made a declaration, a bold declaration. They shed blood to bring that declaration into being. And when it was declared, freedom was theirs. That's what we celebrate every year at the 4th of July, isn't it? Every single year we celebrate our freedom as a country. And the fact of the matter is we never want to be back under British control. Right? I mean, just think of how life would change if the Brits took over again. We would have to drive on the wrong side of the road. We would have to drink tea at two. We would have to bow and curtsy to the royalty. We're like, "Uh uh-uh. I don't want to be controlled by the Brits. Our country does not want to be under British control. We might even have to change our West Texas accents. Yeah, the cotton looks really good this year. (laughs) I think we're going to have a Stella crop. Just wouldn't work out here, would it? We're Americans. We want to act like Americans. We want to live like Americans. We want to be free as Americans. It's the same way as Christians, but even more so. We're believers in Christ. We want to act like believers in Christ. We want to experience freedom like believers in Christ. We don't want to go back under the control of sin and death. We've been set free. Is this working?
So here's what we want to look at today. We're going to look at a couple of passages out of the book of 1 Corinthians. So what does it mean to be free? Well, Paul had this phrase, and if you look in the New International Version, but I've listed the verse out of the English Standard Version, which I like a little better. But in the New International Version, this particular passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, starts with these words, everything is permissible. That's a statement of freedom, isn't it? Everything is permissible. Now, does that sound right? Does that sound like good Christian theology that everything is permissible? I I mean, doesn't that raise some questions? Like, holy moly, are you saying that we can just go out and do anything and everything possible? I mean, can we go back to the sinful lifestyle? I mean, is that what you're saying? So I'm directing these questions to Paul. I mean, Paul was the one who wrote these words, penned these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, he didn't just make this stuff up. God inspired him to write this particular phrase, everything is permissible. That's a declaration of freedom, isn't it? That is a declaration of freedom. If I wasn't free, would everything be permissible? There would be rules and regulations that would dictate my behavior. But here he says, everything is permissible. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. It's a key word, isn't it? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. What happens when freedom goes bad? We start allowing ourselves to be dominated by the things that controlled us in the past. That's what happens, right? So if we want to be free, we need to be aware of those things that controlled us in the past. We've been set free from them. First thing that controlled us was sin. When we were under law, sin was our master. That's why we could never do anything good for God. With sin in charge, there's never going to be anything good that comes out of us, right? Sin is going to lead us to sin. That's just what sin does. But we've been set free, right? We're no longer under British control. We're no longer under the power of sin. But is sin still out there in the world? Yes. Is sin still living in this flesh of ours? Yes. Does sin still have a voice in our day-to-day existence? Do any of you all get tempted? I see one person shaking their head. Can you tell me about some of your <laughs> temptations? And We're just interested. Yeah. We'd like to know. We get tempted, don't we? The things of this world are out there. I mean, you watch television programs, you drive down roads and see billboards, and, and you go to movies and you hear you know, from your kids what's being taught in schools and, you know, what other families are telling their children and all of this sort of stuff. And it's just unbelievable how strong and loud and vocal is that voice of sin in the world today. And what does it want? Control. That's what sin wants in your life. It wants control like it once had. Sin always wants control. What was the lie in the garden? What got Satan kicked out of heaven? The fact that he wanted to kick God off the throne and take over. 
He wanted to be in control, in charge. Large and in charge. Sin speaks Satan's voice. So how do we discern that voice and how do we keep from subjecting ourselves to it, becoming under its control again? In this particular passage, Paul specifically talks about sexual immorality and he's talking about the purpose of our bodies, our physical bodies. You know, when God saved us, He had the whole picture in mind. It wasn't just a spiritual salvation. That's how it started. When you and I were born again, we were born again of the Spirit, right? We looked in the mirror, our bodies were still the same. We could still think some of the same old thoughts that we used to think. But inside, we were brand new. It was a spiritual regeneration. And in that, God had in mind that this life that we have now deep within us would start working its way out into the soul and into the body. Right? That's what God has in mind. That this grace of God that brought salvation to our hearts, that regenerated our spirits, that brought us in union and fellowship with God's Spirit, His indwelling presence, that that life of freedom would work its way out in our thinking, in our choosing, and in our actions. Spirit, soul, to body. So in this particular passage, Paul is talking about the purpose of the body. So the body is not meant for, in this particular context, sexual immorality. The body isn't meant for any sin, right? The, the body, on the other hand, is meant for the Lord. Paul talks about in... Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable act of worship. So the body is not meant for sin. It's not meant to be under the control of sin's desires and wishes. The body is meant for the Lord. And with the body being meant for the Lord... Paul asks some questions, and that's why, this is why I really like this particular passage. Do you not know? In many of Paul's writings, he asks this question, do you not know? You Christian, you believer who has been set free from the law of sin and death, do you not know? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Isn't that great news? That God, through Jesus, purchased you and added you to the body of Christ. You no longer belong to the ways of this world. You no longer belong to sin and death. You belong to Christ. And so much so that He's added you to the body. Second thing He says, do you not know... He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. When folks get married, as the Bible says, the two become one flesh. But here, when we come to know Jesus Christ, it says that we who have been joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. Now, I think we should all just kind of stop and on the count of three, say, wow. One, two, three, wow. I, I, I mean, that is amazing. God's Spirit has come to live inside of us, 
in such a way that there has been a fusion between His Spirit and our spirit, and now we are one. I'm just going to say it again. Wow! I mean, that is just amazing. So, why is that important? Because we have all of these voices that are opposed to our freedom in Christ. Religious voices, fleshly voices, sin voices, trying to rob us of what Jesus Christ has set us free to experience. And the only way that we can navigate through and maintain what God has given us is recognizing that someone greater lives inside of us than he who is in the world. We are one with God's Spirit. And then he says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Did you know one of the great themes uh, of the Bible is the fact that God was trying to find a home? From beginning to end, God is looking for a home. A dwelling place here on earth. He has a heavenly dwelling place. He was looking for some real estate here. Started in a garden. There was a dwelling place. He made himself at home there with Adam and Eve. Sin entered in. Adam and Eve were thrust out of the garden. God called the people, starting with Abraham. He said, I'm going to take you to a land and Eventually, the people of Israel made it to that land, and as they are traveling, Moses leading them, God says, build a tabernacle. What was that? Well, in their minds, it was the dwelling place of God, right? Moses built it. He dedicated it. When he did, the presence of God entered into that holy of holies. It was represented by fire, at night and a cloud of smoke during the day. God's presence with the people. Then Solomon built a temple, dedicated it. Same thing happened. God showed up. But as Paul said, God doesn't live in temples made by hands. He had something else in mind. And remember when Jesus said, you know, tear that temple down in three days and I will rebuild it. He was referring to himself as the temple, as God's dwelling place on earth. As Paul wrote in Colossians, in Jesus is the Godhead bodily. And now Jesus went away, he ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit, and a new temple has been formed. That's the whole picture of Pentecost. You know those tongues of fire that appeared before... uh, above the apostles' heads. What was that? That was the presence of God. What else was there? A wind that swept through. Holy Spirit. Making Himself a home in us. That's who we are. We're the temple of God's Spirit. Where does God live today? In us. We are his home. That's good news, isn't it? So what does that mean? When those voices come that want to dominate, that want to control, that want to take over our lives again and rob us of freedom, what do we do when we hear those voices? Well, in this particular passage, he says, flee. Flee. Doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? Oh, we should be able to just stand up to sin and just speak at it and it should flee. No, the Bible tells us to flee. Why? Because we have flesh. We have flesh that likes to listen to sin's voice. And that flesh can be pretty persuasive. So instead of standing there listening to that voice, the Bible says flee. And then it says to glorify. What does that mean? Glorify God in your body. 
Make your bodies available for His use, for His purpose, for His glory in this world. And that word glory simply means His presence. God has called you to show forth His presence in this world. Again, wow, (laughs) it's amazing. It's amazing. And the second place that we see this passage, everything is permissible. He says this, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. How do we glorify God? Simply by seeking the good of our neighbor. Sin wants us to think about ourselves, right? Sin wants uh, us to put ourselves right in the middle and believe that everything revolves around us. You know, I see parents here, and how many of you parents have had the joy and the privilege and the glee of being able to look at your kids and say, the world doesn't revolve around you. (laughs) Right? And, And you get to say that quite a bit, right? I mean, we're still saying it to our kids, and they're, you know, 22 and 20 and soon to be 18, and We just naturally think that, right? You know, there was a time that scientists believed that the sun revolved around the earth. We believe the world revolves around us. But when we experience freedom as God has designed it, when we are the most free, is when we are forgetting about ourselves and thinking about others. At that point, freedom has reached its full potential in us. It's good news, isn't it? God so loved that He sent His only begotten Son. Freedom is having your heart aligned to his very purpose. When you can say, I'm with God in loving the world and thinking about the world and serving the world. That's what it means to glorify God in your bodies. Make it available for his use to extend his purposes to people out there. They're in bondage. They're enslaved. They're following the ways of this world. They have hearts longing to be free. You're part of those revolutionary war heroes that can come sweeping in and say, freedom is yours in Christ. Don't let those voices rob you of that. Don't let the religious voices, don't let the sinful voices, don't let the fleshly voices rob you of what Christ has accomplished through His death, burial, and resurrection. God sets you free. Don't ever let anybody put you in bondage. But let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we... Thank you that we can proclaim our independence from the world of darkness. Thank you that we can boldly proclaim our independence from sin and death. And we know it's nothing that we've done to secure that. We're free simply because you have set us free. Your truth has set us free. Your love has set us free. Your grace has set us free. Help us to experience that freedom to its full measure, to step with both feet into that freedom. Give us discerning minds to recognize recognize the voices out there that are trying to seek control, trying to dominate, trying to put us under their power. Help us to recognize that they have no place in our heart and in our lives. And thank you that you have 
joined yourself to our spirits in such a powerful way that we can abide in you and see this freedom extend out to our souls and to our bodies so that we can truly glorify you in all that we do. We thank you for this in Christ's matchless name. Amen. You guys stand with us. Have a great week.